So uh, let me start by saying uh, that I, I don't think it's a small deal. I, I, I believe with all of my heart in the strategy of the Lord. I, I think um, it a great privilege to be the one addressing you guys this morning at this hour at this time. And I know it was Pastor Adam, I think it was maybe, I don't know, a couple months ago, asked me, he said, do you have November uh, 8th available? And I said, I do. I said, I've got something on Saturday. I said, but Sunday is wide open. So uh, I know it might be him that asked me to come, but I do believe in the providence of God that he um, actually wanted me to be here uh, and to share the things I want to share with you guys this morning. Amen? So um, let, me, let me begin by saying this. I've made comments like this in the past uh, 1 Corinthians 13.9 says that we prophesy in part and we know in part. And I want to say to you that, to me, that means a couple of things. One, it means sometimes those of us who are making prophetic statements, for honest, we really don't even fully know what it is we're talking about. And mostly because we don't have the entire picture. We might have glimpses of things. We might be seeing in a mirror dimly. But a lot of you guys know hindsight is... There you go. So... Um, what I typically do with the Lord, uh, and those of you that attend here, you'll, you, this won't be a surprise to you, is a lot of times what I'll do is when, when we're coming up on a, on a new year, I'll oftentimes get along with the Lord and say, Lord, what's, what's going on? What can we anticipate over these next 365 days as we're getting ready at this time to enter into 2020? So in 2019, probably December, I sat down with the Lord and I said, what is it that you are going to be telling us or wanting us to focus on, or what do you want to say to your people concerning this coming year? And the Lord ultimately gave me one word. Some of you might remember it. It was the word overwhelmed. So, amen, Keith. I, I agree. He's got his hand in the air. He's like, amen. Um, both God and the enemy have one thing in common. They want to overwhelm your inside. And God wants us overwhelmed within so we can't be overwhelmed without. And the enemy wants your external reality to determine your internal reality. And I'm going to tell you the sermon in one sentence today. If it's taking you from his face, it's not properly nourishing you. Cue the piano for dramatic effect. We didn't plan that at all. I'll say it again. If it's taking you from his face, it's not properly nourishing you. Everything that's happening right now, guys, is trying to get to your heart. I say it all the time. You hear with your eyes and you see with your ears and you might be like, that is the weirdest thing I ever heard. Well, no, because faith comes by, determines what I see, and what I see has the ability to talk to me. And where you put your eyes right now really matters. And what you're listening to right now really matters. And I want you to know that just because you're a Christian, I, I, I understand, this is, I promise you this is going to be encouraging. That's my heart's desire. My heart is so full, but my heart is very, very, very sad right now. Really, really sad with a lot of different things. And, um but I'm encouraged in Christ. I'm encouraged in the Lord. Every born-again Christian has the Holy Spirit living in them. Isn't that beautiful? What I mean, it's probably one of the greatest miracles. The New Covenant does so many things, but I mean, that's got to be right at the top. You became a temple of God Himself. Make no mistake, the Holy Spirit is not an aspect of His personality. He's not a mystical force. It's God Himself. Every bit of fellowship you have with the Lord is through the Holy Spirit because the Father is in heaven, Jesus is seated at his right hand, and it's at this time that the Holy Spirit and his presence is here and he's living inside of people. But I want to tell you that the place in which God has in your heart, the, the, the level of occupancy that Jesus has in your heart is dependent upon your faith in him. There's a difference between God living in me in the spirit and Jesus occupying every place in my heart. And I'm going to show it to you here in a moment biblically. I, I want to say this right off the bat, that 
they, they came to the Jesus after he was raised from the dead. The Bible says in Acts chapter 1 that he appeared to them over the course of 40 days. And during that 40-day period, he gave them orders by the Holy Spirit, one of them being that they would wait in Jerusalem until they received the promise of the Father, which was what? The baptism in the Holy Spirit. You guys know what I'm talking about? Amen. We've been talking about it for a long time. So, I'm still convinced with all my heart that it's our greatest need today. I was up in the Lewisburg area yesterday. I was meeting with a group of about 20 pastors, and I just impassionedly, just with passion in my heart, not because I was trying to make an emphatic statement, I said, please somebody tell me right now what else it is that we're going to be praying for and what we should be praying for. If you, if you genuinely have something better in mind, I'm all ears. I don't know what else to cry out for than for God to pour out his spirit. And when I'm talking about revival, I'm not talking about us holding meetings and scheduling them during the week and I'm not talking about evangelistic effort. I'm talking about when God steps down and there's a consciousness of God and people are gripped by his presence and he himself is the evangelist. Where there's people in the streets asking the question, is there mercy for me? where they don't need to hear from Pastor Brian, and it's not that God doesn't use people in the midst of environments and climates like that. He does, but if you study your Bible in Acts chapter 2, it says the Lord added to their number daily. It was His presence that did that. And so why, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because before this moment happens when the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost, the disciples ask him a very concerning question that I believe is in the heart of a great many of us right now. And the number one question that they ask him is this, is it at this time you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is it at this time where you're going to make right th- wrong things right? Is it this time where we're going to rule and reign with you? Is it at this time where we can expect you to do X, Y, and Z? And please forgive me, guys, that is a political question. Is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And what is his answer? It's not for you to know the times, the epics, the seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you because that's the great need for today guys regardless of whoever sits in office I'm not changing my mind about what I think our need is today in this country because we can sit here and sing he's my living hope he either is or he's not And I'm not saying like that whoever sits in that place isn't important. Guys, I, I know that that is true. I know that it's going to determine so much of the days ahead. But I refuse to be distracted right now by all of that stuff and taken off the course of crying out for the Lord and asking Him to pour out His Spirit. So, so there have been a few times in my life where God has awakened me out of my sleep by a, with a sound. And the best way I can describe it is I am completely sound asleep and I hear while I'm asleep what I would hear as though I was awake. It's not like it's a dream. I hear an audible sound and it awakens me out of my sleep. And that's something we need to pay attention to right now because I believe God is wanting to awaken people. So in 2014, I heard the sound of this doorknob that was being turned. You know how like, you can hear the inner workings of the doorknob being turned, like the clickety-clack? And I heard this door being opened, and it was at that time where the Lord said, uh, this is going to be an open-door year. And then in 2015, I'm dead asleep, and all of a sudden I hear two audible sounds of, of, of gunshots back and forth, bang, bang, and it sat me straight up in my bed. And you guys know, if that would physically really happen, your wife would have sat up right next to you, but Nicole was sound asleep. And I said to the Lord, I said, what is that about? And he said, it's trying to kill you. And that was one of the hardest years that I'd ever gone through as a Christian. That was one of the most difficult times and seasons because of what was coming against me demonically. Well, just recently on October 29th, it was a Wednesday, Thursday night, I'm sleeping and my wife is in, in the bed. And the next thing I know, I hear the sound of what's like my TV remote being slammed on my nightstand. And I sit straight up in my bed and I said, Lord, what was that? What does that mean? And he said, put away the distractions.
Six days later, which I think is on purpose because I think he's saying hero man because it's the sixth day where God made man. I'm sitting there again and I'm sleeping and the next thing I know I'm awakened again. But this time it's the sound of a hand smacking a wall really hard going. And I sit up straight in my bed and I said, what was that? And he said, it's urgent. It's urgent that we would be sober, that we would be vigilant for the purpose of prayer. Guys, please listen to me. Everything that's happening right now, please don't let it cause you to lose heart. There's more that's at stake right now than who's going to sit in that office and what's at stake is revival in this nation. Do you know what my concern is? If you want me to be honest, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this one. Because some of you probably already tuned me out because of what I already opened up with. You know what I said to those 20-some pastors yesterday? I said, okay, so I said, let's say Trump gets elected. I said, what does that mean? We go back to sleep for another four years? Because that's all, still at the end of the day, what the nation needs is an outpouring of God's spirit. This country needs a sound from heaven again. This country needs a suddenly that suddenly changes people. Do you know those people were willing to, die, willing to deny him, now they're willing to die for him. That happens because God steps down. But if you're not careful, what your eyes right now are looking at, what your ears are hearing is trying to totally disrupt what God is wanting to establish and root you in internally. It's always a fight for this, guys. Like, God is after your heart, the enemy is after your heart. The enemy wants to absolutely overwhelm you outwardly so that you're no good inwardly. The enemy would love nothing more than for us to be asleep in here because when we're asleep in here, we're no good out here. That's why it says, awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead because when I'm sleeping in here, I'm dead externally. And the enemy is wanting us. The enemy could care less, guys, if we're here this morning. The enemy could, the enemy could care less. The enemy could care less about our Bible knowledge. What he is concerned with, however, is our intimacy level with Jesus. That's what he's trying to keep us out of. He's trying to keep you and I out of our prayer closet. Why? Because if it's taking you from his face, it's not properly nourishing you. Jesus said man will not live on, so he's not condoning a low-carb lifestyle there. He's not promoting keto when he's making that comment. He's saying there's more to you than meets the eye. There's more to you than a physical body. And unless it's fed on a relationship with me, you're not going to be satisfied. I told the first service, I said, guys, he taught us to pray about his will coming to earth, his will being done. But he also said, give us this day our daily. So what he has for you has an expiration date on it called this day. That means he's not going to refrigerate for you today what you were supposed to eat yesterday. What you failed to eat today is no good tomorrow. And we wonder why we're not doing good inside. It's because we're frantically feeding ourselves on everything else at the end of the day don't matter. My hope is an outpouring of God's spirit like never before. My hope is that God would so pour out his spirit that we would see a greater glory that comes to the church that produces workers for harvest. That's my concern. And like I've told you guys before, I'd rather be known for washing people's feet and feeding the poor and giving to the poor than being right on social media. I'd rather be known for seeing tumors disappear than fighting and bickering, guys. Like, there's so much right now that God is dealing with in my own life. There's distractions that I just have to put away. I confess I have not been faithful in this area lately. I confess I've never felt more tempted to anger and frustration in my life. I confess I've never felt more tempted to just give it to somebody. And that's not Christ, man. There's a place where you're angry and you don't sin. There's a place where tables need to be turned over. But then there's a place where you're actually weeping with the people that you're concerned about. Maybe even those that anger you and frustrate you. And I want to be in that place. But my heart, man, my heart's so grieved. My heart's grieved for my daughter going back to school tomorrow and what she's probably going to face there. What's already she's had to face. 
I am so grieved over the way we've treated each other. I'm so grieved over dumb stuff like kind ways to make underhand comments. Stuff we post on each other's pages. Little digs that we make. Man, I'm just over that stuff. I got no time for it anymore. It doesn't help and it doesn't edify anybody. Out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks there's more than one way we use our words. I'm grieved over the amount of anger. I'm grieved over the frustration. I'm grieved over the division. I'm grieved over all of the stuff that's tearing the fabric of this nation and the church and families. I'm grieved over it. I could just sit and cry. And what's the answer going to be? Him. So please, I'll... Tell me what else I should be praying for. I'm all ears. He's my need. He is what I believe we need now more than ever. So... I want to turn you guys to Ephesians 3 here for a moment, then we're going to look at Luke chapter 10. You know, Jesus said in Luke 18, he said, it says, he taught them this parable that all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. So the only way we're not going to lose heart is by constantly praying, is by sitting with him. But the enemy is trying to keep you out of that place. The enemy wants you so distracted right now in this time and season. The enemy wants us talking about so many other things than about Jesus. The enemy wants us talking about a multitude of different stuff. He wants, he wants to, to occupy every place that he can in our heart. He is looking for real estate that Jesus hasn't yet satisfied. He's looking for vacant lots. He wants to get into those places. And the reason why I say you can have God living in you, but but the level in which God or Jesus fills your heart is dependent on your faith in him is found here in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse, verse 14. Paul says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father. I love that. I, I can't think of anybody who's more in tune, more uh, uh, caring in terms of the church at large, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. That means that's where your identity comes from, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. So God cares about your and my internal reality, and it's strengthened through the Holy Spirit, not through self-help. It's strengthened through our relationship with him. He cares about what's going on inside because whatever's going on in the inside is going to manifest outwardly. He goes on to say, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So the occupancy by which God, Jesus himself, has in my heart, the occupancy level Jesus has is dependent upon my faith in him. The more I know him, the more overwhelmed I am by him internally. You know, Jesus made statements like this in, in John, I believe it was 14 or 15, the ruler of the world is coming, he has nothing in me. What a statement. Jesus so knew who he was, was so bathed, clothed, filled with the Holy Spirit, knew where he was going back to, knew that his life wasn't his own, that he was, him, he, it's like his heart was an impenetrable fortress. And I believe in this hour, now more than ever, God is wanting to overwhelm us inside, guys, so that we're not overwhelmed without. He goes on to say, and may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and the height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. I have no idea what that means, but I want it. I want to be filled with the fullness of God, and it, it deals specifically with you and I coming to know the love of Christ. But that's not going to happen if something else has my gaze. If it's, if it's taking you from his face, it will not properly nourish you. 
man will not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds. It's, that's, that's, it's not proceeded. It's not talking past tense. Proceeds. Because our God ever lives, ever reigns. The word of God itself is alive and active. The Holy Spirit is speaking. God has things for you and I every single day. That's the reason, guys, why in the wilderness they were commanded every morning to gather the manna for themselves, that they would have something to eat. But if it wasn't gathered, it was rotted the next day. They couldn't go back and eat it. But it doesn't say that I was to go out and collect enough for me and for Adam because Adam's not supposed to live off of my revelation. I can encourage Adam. I can spur him on. But each and every one of us, God has something for us individually. And I am telling you guys, there is, it's, it's more about what we're saying. It's not so much about what we're saying. It's about our posture before him. It's about realizing that he has something that satisfies, that the world can't satisfy. No matter what's happening in the world right now, I cannot allow it to, I cannot, I I can't afford to allow it to take my eyes off of him. That's what the enemy wants. The enemy wins when he has your attention. The battle is in your mind, but the war is always for your heart. Because the heart is the throne of why I do what I do and why I say what I say. The heart is the throne of my inner person. The heart is the throne of my motivations. Everything in life, Jesus said, hey, guard your heart above everything else. Why? Because from it flow the issues of life. That means, guys, everything in our life comes from that place. And we're to guard it. Well, how do you guard it? The best weapon against the enemy is a no occupancy sign is when Jesus so fills your heart through faith. Trust in the Lord your God with all of your, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him. So one of the ways by which we trust in him, guys, you can only trust who you know. You can only trust who you know. And so I believe now, in this time, more than ever, we need to position ourselves rightly at his feet. And like my friend Nick Billman says, at his feet is the highest place to be because the lower I go before him, the more he raises me up in him. Grace comes to the humble. Is that about self-promotion? No, it's about Christ exalted in me. It's about grace doing something in my life that causes me to look more like him. So how, how do we go about doing this? Well, Let's turn to Luke chapter 10. And while you're turning there, let me say this. I'll give you some tips. Jesus made a statement in Matthew 6. He said, and when you pray, go in your inner room, close your door, and your father who is in secret, when you seek him, your father who is in secret, he will reward you. Do you know what that tells me? I understand, guys, that there are some of us that say, I don't have time in the day to pray. I kind of pray going about my day. That is never a substitute for you getting alone and closing the door. It never will be. He closed the door and your father who is in secret. What does that mean? It means that God dwells in a place called secret because God loves it when we seek after him. There are countless times all throughout the Bible where it says, seek my face. Those seek first the kingdom of God. Those that seek me with all of their heart, they will find me. All throughout the Bible, one of the leading commands is seek. Seek him while he can be found, the prophet Isaiah says. So there's something very special that happens when I go get alone and I close the door and I sit there with him. It's solitude, seclusion, and silence are really important with the Lord. So many of us, we wonder sometimes, what should I say when I get in there? Don't worry about it. Do you know what matters the most? Is the posture you take before him, not the words you say. Because if I get alone in there and I sit before him and he knows the reason for which that I'm there, that my heart is bent low because I realize he's got something to say that if I don't eat it today, I'm probably not going to be my best version of myself. So I I don't think it has to be difficult, guys. There are scriptures that say things like this, be still and know that he's God. Sometimes that's prayer for me. Sometimes I don't say a word. Sometimes I am just there and I am just thinking about him and knowing who he is does something to me. And sometimes it's not even a word that I say. It's just simply being with him is more than enough. But you have this story here. I've preached on it many times in Luke chapter 10. I'm going to hit this, then I'm going to read something to you, then I'm going to to be done. 
It says in Acts chapter, no, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 10, verse 38, it says, Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. He will always come where he's wanted. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and anyone who opens up to me, I will come in, and I will dine with him. So what if you did this? What if you went and you got alone, and you said, Jesus... I am here for no other reason. I don't need a thing from you, but the number one reason why I'm here is just to be with you. When I look upon your face, Jesus, I'm changed. Because my Bible says, now I with an unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the image and the glory of the Lord. What I behold changes me. The Christian life is not about behaving, it's about beholding. You trying harder will never change you. You staring at his face will change you. You getting alone with him and looking at him, look full into his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. Boy, do we need that now more than ever. The enemy is trying to make things matter more that don't matter most. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet listening to his word. Guys, posture is prayer. That is a posture that says, I have, I need what it is you have. I don't know what he was saying to her. I often wonder what would captivate her heart in that manner that she would sit. And even though her sister is the one who is distracted, And even though it's her sister who begins accusing her, it doesn't steal her gaze. Whatever's happening around her doesn't take her, cause her to take her eyes off of his face. And I feel like that's the kind of people we need to be right now. Not people who are losing hope. Not people who are caught up with everything else right now that's going on in the world. I'm not saying it's important. I'm saying it doesn't matter most. When they asked him that question, is it now the time that you are finally going to set up shop and clean it all up? He said, it's not for you to know the times and the epics which the Father appointed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Then you will be my witness. This world needs the gospel. That's what it needs to hear. And there is no effective witness apart from the person of the Holy Spirit. And I confess to you that I desperately need more of him. When I sit and I read and I look at how those men lived in the book of Acts, that does something to me. I see what his presence did I'm okay with good meetings we had one yesterday I'm okay with occasional healings I'm okay with accurate prophetic words Jesus said the things I do you will do and more is anybody bothered by that does anybody care that they're not there says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were hungry for the word of God. It says 3,000 in a moment got saved. 3,000. Not because they were, oh God, help us. Jeez. shame on us guys in so many ways and I'm not saying that like shame on you I'm saying shame like from a place of God forgive us
3,000 like that because Peter preached, what, all of two minutes? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. A sense of awe was among them, God adding to their number daily, going from the temple, taking their meals together in each other's homes with gladness and sincerity of heart. No one thinking whatever they owned belonged to them, but they sold it and gave to everybody else. I want to see that. When, when God woke me up and he said, it's urgent, put away the distractions. I think the enemy doesn't want us crying out for it. I think he wants us more concerned with what's happening right now and all the anger. And guys, be careful. Please just be careful. Be careful what you let in your own heart. You know, I read in later on in Acts 5 where Ananias and Sapphira, you know what happened to those guys. Because when you have that level of glory present, you can't sin and get away with it. When God in that level of glory is present, but you know what happened? That says the people, jeez, man. The people held the church in high esteem. And I don't see that today. Because I think we're starting to become more known for our anger and our frustrations. And the church was held in high esteem because God was there. And it says people, were, yeah, I would be too. If I saw Adam drop over dead, I'd be like, whoa, what the heck just happened? In Acts 5, when Ananias and Sapphira, that happens, and they carry him out, it says, great fear came over all the people because God stepped down, because God was real. When I talk about revival, I'm talking about a consciousness of God that sweeps a community. Where people are convicted of their sin, running to the church because they want to know if there's hope for them, What has happened, guys, to, to, to us? We, gosh. And you know, what's, you know what sucks? Hey, can I use that word? You know how many people prophesied certain things? What, what happens if it doesn't come true? Now what? What does that mean? And I see so many hearts failing because we're putting faith in people's words and not in the word of God itself. God's heart so sad. Emma, Emma hates when I cry on stage. Nobody wants to see their dad cry. I feel like, I know I could get in trouble for saying this, I feel like we've been so concerned is that this time you're going to restore the kingdom. And I think we missed it. sorry I think the number one thing on God's heart this year is revival trust me I voted trust me I voted my values trust me I didn't vote for personality I voted for values but at the end of the day no matter what happens I know what I'm going after. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter to me. What matters is that I'm so on fire and I'm unashamed of the gospel and I'm seeing miracle signs, wonders, and God is moving mightily. That's what I care about. And I'm waiting for the church. Oh, gosh, like, uh, I'm convinced we still don't believe it's our need. And the proof of it is the prayer meetings are empty. That's the proof. You can say what you want while well, I've got the X, Y, and Z going on in my life. 
But I, I truly believe if we were convinced that God was our need, we'd be there. I really do. I think there's something powerful about God's people coming together and praying. There's a, a revival, oh gosh man, there's a revival that I believe is so exceedingly prophetic for the day we live in right now. There's a revival that happened off of the tip of Scotland, just northwest called the Hebrides, the Hebride Isles, which is our Scottish Isles. 1949, two old women, 185, 183, one couldn't see, one was bent over. They were grieved by the state of the church in the absence of God's glory and presence. And so these old women, these old women, 85, 83, they had one verse, just one. I will pour out rain on those who are thirsty and streams upon the dry ground. And they believed that God was a covenant-keeping God, and they believed He had to do it. They believed He had to keep His word. So every Tuesday night, every Friday night from 10 p.m. to 4, 3 or 4 in the morning, they would get on their knees and pray. We know nothing of sacrifice. We can say we're hungry all we want. Elderly women. Out praying every one of us in the room probably. One of them had a vision about a strange man in their pulpit. So they called for the pastor of their church and said, told them the story. And then they told him, you need to take your deacons and elders and we think you should pray the same days and the same hours we're praying. And he listened to them because he knew that they were God-fearing and he trusted them. He trusted that they heard from God. So they did. Every Tuesday and Friday, from 10 to 3 in the morning, on their knees, asking God to keep his promise. And one day, after about two months of doing that, two months, maybe longer, one young kid, one of the deacons, stood up and he read from Psalm 24, where it says, who can ascend the hill of God? Who can stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. I'm more concerned about that than who my president is. I'm more concerned, are my hands clean and is my heart pure? And that little, that young kid lifted his hands to heaven and said, oh God, are my hands clean and is my heart pure? And he got no further than that and fell in a trance and fell in the straw and God came down. Why? Because he was concerned if his life pleased God. And every God sent revival is tied to holiness. Every one. You can be so concerned about who your next president is and be vile and full of hate at the same time. Angry about it. I'm not doing it anymore, guys. I'm more concerned about the salvation, even within my own family, than that. I'm tired of falling for the schemes of the devil. I'm tired of all the anger and the division that's in the world. I'm tired of the bickering, the back and forth. I'm tired that my daughter has to go to school and deal with that. And I refuse to become it. I'm not doing it anymore. I believe it's time to seek the Lord. I'm not going to stop talking about it. I think it's been on his heart for the last seven months.
You know, sometimes even your own tears are prayer, guys. Sometimes, sometimes it's a groaning. Like one man said, sometimes it's a broken sentence. Sometimes it's just your tears. But I confess I've let things get to me. I've let things bother me as of late. I've had my eyes on other things more than the Lord. And I repent before everybody today. And I believe God is wanting all of us to get our house in order. I believe he's wanting us to get ready for what he's going to pour out. And I'm not going to stop until I see it. Amen. I don't know what else to say. I'm sorry. I don't know what else to say. Thank God Adam's going to come up and transition. But I... I just, I just, I could just go get alone and just, and just cry. Is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, it's not really up to you to know the times and the epics which God has fixed by his own authority. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then you'll be my witness in Jerusalem and Judea, in all the remotest places of the earth. That's my concern. Not who my 46th president is. Not saying it's not important. So don't walk out here and be like, man, that guy's whatever. I told you I voted. I believe it's my voice. But at the end of the day, it's not going to stop me. The answer is still the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, I just, I come before you myself, maybe representing other people in the room. I confess, I've taken my eyes off of you. I've allowed myself to be distract, distracted. I've allowed my internal reality at times to be determined by what was happening externally. And I come back to you and say, Jesus, please just be the focus again. Pour out your spirit like never before. What else, could, what else are we going to ask for? So, Father, I thank you. I thank you for convicting me. I thank you for arresting my heart. I thank you for being the desire of my heart. And I pray that you would just receive any repentance that happened in the room this afternoon, this morning. And you would help us to right the ship again. And that you would cause us to come together and cry out in unity around what we need and around the mandate of going into all the world and making disciples of all nations. That's the Christian life.